Uh, Mr. President, I, I too want to lend my voice to the I listening to the discussion that just occurred on the floor. Uh, I don't think there's any group of Americans that d are more deserving of our support than the men and women who've worn the uniform uh, of this country and so bravely and courageously defended America's freedom and our democracy. And I, uh, I hope, uh, like my colleagues who spoke just uh, a minute ago, that we can uh, uh, come to an agreement that would allow us to do the things on which we agree. There are so many things. I think that 80 percent of um, the debate last week between what the senator from Vermont proposed and the senator from North Carolina proposed were the same things. And we ought to be able at least to, uh, to do those things that we agree on and address some of the very vital and urgent needs that our veteran community has. And so I uh, would lend my voice to uh, supporting efforts to get things moving. There is a bill that's come over from the House of Representatives that addresses many of these issues, um, not as comprehensively as, uh, as was proposed last week by the senator from Vermont or the senator from North Carolina. But um, obviously, we've got some issues that need to be addressed that will support and help uh, those Americans who have borne the cost of battle for our country and depend, defended America's freedoms. And uh, we, should, uh, we should work together to define that agreement and, uh, and to move legislation forward that would address those needs. Mr. President, I come to the floor today to talk about the pain that Obamacare and the Obama economy are causing Americans. Uh, CBS News and the New York Times released a new poll last week that found that there was widespread dissatisfaction with President Obama. 59% of the American people are disappointed in the president's uh, presidency, the poll found, while 63% think the country's on the wrong track. Just 38% of people in this country approve of the president's handling of the economy, and 39% approve of his handling of foreign policy. And it, when it comes to the president's signature law, Obamacare, just 6%, 6% of the American people think the law is working well. A whopping 92% support changing the health care law or repealing it altogether. In similar news, Gallup reported last month that its economic confidence index was negative for every single state. In other words, a majority of Americans in every state have a generally negative view of the economy. Only, only in D.C., in the District of Columbia, home of too many disconnected Democrat politicians, did Gallup find a net positive view of the economy. So needless to say, Mr. President, the American people are, to put it mildly, dissatisfied. And why are they dissatisfied? Well, because they've spent five years waiting for the relief that they were promised, and it hasn't arrived. A Pew Research Center poll in September found that 63% of the American people believe that the nation's economic system is no more secure today than it was before the 2008 market crash. The same poll also found that majorities of Americans report that household incomes and the job situation have hardly recovered at all from the recession. Mr. President, the President may have inherited, President Obama may have inherited a difficult economic situation, but he's had five years to make it better. Instead, he's making things worse. Over the past five years, household income has declined by $3,600. Income inequality is at its highest point literally since the Great Depression. The number of Americans receiving food stamps has soared from over 32 million to now more than 47 million, almost 48 million Americans receiving food stamps. That means that one in five Literally one in five American households is on food stamps. Ten million Americans are unemployed, almost four million of them for more than six months, and the labor force participation rate is at Jimmy Carter era lows, thanks in part to literally thousands of Americans who have simply given up hope of ever finding a job and dropped out of the labor force altogether. And then, and then there's the president's health care law. The president promised his health care law would lower costs while allowing you to keep the plan and the doctor that you liked. In reality, health care costs have skyrocketed, and Americans have been losing their doctors and their health care plans in droves. Seniors are being hit hard by cuts to the Ameri Medicare Advantage program, and low-income seniors are being hit the hardest. Meanwhile, businesses are struggling with the law's burdensome taxes and regulations, while workers struggle with reduced hours and fewer opportunities. A recent report from the Congressional Budget Office found that the President's health care law will reduce the number of full-time workers by up to 2.5 million over the next 10 years. Then there's last week's report from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services that found that 11 million small businesses are going to see workers have their premiums increase as a result of Obamacare. 
And yesterday, in an attempt to improve the Democrats' steadily worsening, elect worsening election prospects in November, the administration announced yet another, another Obamacare delay for a select few health plans, as well as a carve-out for the administration's union friends. It's no wonder Americans are so unhappy. But despite the abundance of evidence that their policies have failed, the Democrats and the President continue to dismiss American stories. In fact, the Senate Majority Leader had the gall the other day to get up on the floor of the United States Senate and say every single Obamacare horror story is untrue. That's right. Instead of looking at the overwhelming evidence that Obamacare just isn't working and maybe rethinking his support of that law, the Majority Leader decided to accuse every single American who's had a bad experience with Obamacare of lying about his or her story. Now, that's a lot of denial right there. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different result, yet that's just exactly what Democrats and the President are doing. Instead of looking at the evidence of the past five years and rethinking their policies, Democrats are just piling on more and more of the same. With Americans hurting for jobs and opportunities, Democrats have recently taken to advocating a hike in the minimum wage, a policy, I might add, that the Congressional Budget Office said would result in up to one million fewer jobs and a policy that would hit the lowest income workers the hardest. And then, then there's the President's budget. The President's budget proposal would have been a great opportunity for the President to rethink some of these failed strategies of the past five years and to focus on controlling spending and promoting economic growth. Instead, the President produced a political document that panders to the far left wing of his party and eschews any type of meaningful reform. His budget won't control spending. Uh, instead, it increases spending by 63% over the next 10 years, and it adds another $8.3 trillion to our $17 trillion debt. And to pay for some of that spending, the administration is proposing even more tax increases, over a trillion dollars worth of new tax increases, on top of the $1.7 trillion in tax increases the President's already gotten since he came to office. The administration's even backed away from changes to our broken entitlement programs, like gradually raising the eligibility age for Medicare, which would have helped put the Medicare program on a stronger financial footing going forward. And as for balancing the budget, well, that's a fantasy. The President's budget doesn't even pretend to balance. With two years left in his presidency, it appears that the President has given up on governing and resigned himself to playing election year politics. His lame duck budget will further grow the federal government while the middle class continues to shrink. If the President and the Democrats really wanted to help Americans the way they claim to, there are real steps that they could take right now to start turning our economy around and putting Americans back to work. Instead of a job-killing minimum wage hike, they could support initiatives to reduce the cost of hiring and to give businesses incentives to hire workers. Instead of perpetually extending unemployment benefits, they could support legislation, like a bill I've introduced, to provide relocation resources to allow the long-term unemployed to move to areas where the job market is stronger and strengthen federal worker training programs. This would help give the unemployed what they really want, not months of meager government benefits, but steady, good-paying jobs with the potential for growth. And speaking of jobs, Mr. President, if the President wanted to create jobs immediately, he could instantly, today, with the stroke of the pen that he talks about, approve the bipartisan Keystone Pipeline and the 42,000 plus jobs that it would support. All it would take is a stroke of that pen that he keeps talking about. And then there's Trade Promotion Authority. The President did talk about Trade Promotion Authority in his State of the Union address, but he abandoned it shortly afterward to address some Democrats' political concerns about pushing the policy in an election year. Trade Promotion Authority would help farmers, ranchers, entrepreneurs, and job creators gain access to one billion new consumers around the globe. If the President were serious about creating jobs for Americans, he'd be urging the majority leader to take up this bipartisan legislation today. Finally, the President should be supporting bipartisan efforts to repeal the costly medical device tax in his health care law, the tax on pacemakers and insulin pumps. According to a recent study, more than 30,000 jobs in the medical device industry have been affected by this burdensome provision 
in the law. If this tax isn't eliminated soon, even more jobs in this industry are going to be lost or sent overseas. Mr. President, it's not surprising that the American people are unhappy. Obamacare and the Obama economy have done nothing to ease the struggles that Americans have faced since the recession. And instead of proposing new initiatives, Democrats and the President continue to push for more of the same and to double down on the same failed policies. Well, Mr. President, five years is long enough. It's time for Democrats to abandon their failed economic experiments and to work with Republicans to pass legislation that will actually create jobs and opportunities and put Americans back to work. Mr. President, we can do that. We can do that today. The President can pick up the phone that he talks about, call the Majority Leader, ask him to bring up any one of these initiatives that I've mentioned on which there is broad bipartisan support, Keystone Pipeline, Trade Promotion Authority, initiatives that would grow jobs, repealing the medical device tax. There were 79 votes in the United States Senate on an amendment to the budget last year in support of repealing that onerous tax. There are things that we can do together, that we can do today, that would create jobs, grow and expand this economy, lower the cost of hiring people in this country so that we can get more Americans back to work with good paying jobs that will help lift them higher in their economic circumstances and give them a better and a brighter future. Mr. President, I hope that that's what the President will choose to do, rather than following through on so many of these election year ploys, if you will, that are simply designed to help win elections come election day, rather than do something that is really meaningful to help middle class families and the American people. Mr. President, I